I recently read an interview you did on the ASCLS website, um, one question, and, and you said that ASCLS is in the midst of transformational changes currently. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you feel this is a critical moment for your organization and the medical laboratory professionals as a whole. Well, I'll start with the, uh, an email I received just this week. Uh, it was from a past president and it basically shined the light on what the society was, say, in 1970. But it was the, the idea that there were 30,000 members when he was president. Um, and then where we are today, the number now is, is 6,000. So when we say transformational change, what we're trying to do is trying to change that trajectory downward. So, you know, when we, we look at us, uh, you know, as we were called ASMT uh, back in that time. So it was the American Society of Medical, you know, Techs. So it was like, it was like the profession membership would come to ASMT. And now there's options. You know, there's, if you're gonna join a professional society, there's, you know, there's joining ASCP, there's joining ASM, there's joining AACC. There's joining AABB. So you've got, you know, you got options as far as the membership goes. So part of part of the the uh, you know the question that I had, the, the member the nominations gave me the question and I answered it uh, live, and then I gave a summary article that you read. But some of that what I talked about was just that the the idea of promoting our society, promoting our profession is on us. So we don't, we can't look for anybody else to say, you know, well, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And we took our meeting in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I looked at it as a stockholders meeting. I felt like th these are, these are the invested members, the leaders of our society. And it's like a stockholder meeting uh, that we get together once a year. Um, we, we have address our issues and then we have to go out and we have to promote the things that we do. And we start with our three pillars. We have, you know, community, we have advocacy, and we have knowledge. So we think we cover all three really well. We think the community of ASCLS is, is, is the lab family. Uh, most of our members will address it that way. They will talk about, I'm going to meet with my lab family and spend time with my lab family. But we'd like to take that feeling and back it up into the hospital labs. That's where our members aren't. <laughs> They're not there. Um, you go into a hospital lab and you may have one, you know, one person in there may be a member, uh, but you may walk into a hospital lab and there's no members of ASCLS in that lab. And we feel like we are the, the, the society for, as we say, the, the bench tech, the, the generalist, the one working the bench, the one processing all these billions of tests that we've looked at in the last two years who's doing that, that's who we want to be a member and feel proud about being a member. So we're looking to promote it with inside the hospitals. We get a chance as uh, educators to promote it up to our graduates. So they're well aware of ASCLS and society, you know, professional societies when they graduate. Some of them join as students. We have student membership. They join when they graduate, they move their membership to what we call the advancing professional. Um, and then you have the professional membership after that. So it's a stepping way where they don't have to just be the professional member when they first get out. But it feels like we're we're fighting this battle of getting the the I guess the urgency of joining or wanting to join or be a part of this with a membership. It, it, it's it's hard to go to them and say you know hey we want we want you to be a member we want you to join. So when we talk about the change that was needed, we have to try to find a way, promote, get new members, get new people to join. Um, and that's going to be the key to survival as a society. We, we, we're not going to be able to decline our membership every year and hope to do the things that we're doing now. So we have our clinical lab educators conference coming up next. It's in New Orleans. So this is where, where I was first introduced to ASCLS. This is where our educators come together to share with each other, present to each other on things they're doing in the classroom and the laboratory uh, with their programs. And it's very 
it's top notch. Everybody loves this conference. Uh, all the educators love coming together and sharing their ideas. We have like 40 presentations. And uh, this year we had 120 proposals for 40 spots. So it's very, um, it's an honor to get selected. It's very prestigious to present to your fellow uh, educators. Um, then we just got through with the lab uh, legislative symposium for advocacy. We see that on social media platforms all the time. Who's doing what for us? Who's helping us? Who's out there working hard to for our salaries, for our working conditions, for our staffing needs? Who's the voice? And we feel like we are the voice. Uh, we feel like we we go to the hill and and you know the senator knows we're coming in. They recognize our faces. They know our names. They know we're coming to talk about the laboratory and that's what you want because every other profession is doing the exact same thing. So if we're not in there and we're not visiting their office and we're not going up there and making the effort, then they're going to hear from the physicians. They're going to hear from the hospital administrators. They're going to hear from the nurses. They're going to hear from every other co-profession co that we have. So we, we need to be stronger. We need to be bigger. And we try to say, you know, the more members we have, the louder our voice will be uh, when we're wanting to make changes. So those, that's the kind of things that I've been, you know, devoted to and committed to is trying to change the, the membership trajectory of our society uh, to get everyone involved that's a member now to, to recruit new members. And we have that, but we need more. Well, piggybacking off of that a little bit, um, talking about membership challenges, <clears throat> obviously you've referenced it a couple times now, you know, some of the staffing shortages labs everywhere are currently dealing with. Um, how can your organization play a role in addressing some of these widespread shortages and overall lack of programs graduate, graduating new uh, medical lab professionals? Well, taking that first point, the last point you made, we get um, notified with any educational program that is is in trouble. Um, so it's not as bad as it was, um, but it's still not growing to the point where we feel like we're going to make a dent in the workforce shortage anytime soon. But if a program, a community college or a college universities program is under a threat of cutting, uh, we'll make it we'll make an effort. We'll we'll try to get the support. We will give everything we can to support the idea of keeping that program in place. And that's one thing we do. But another thing we, we're looking at as far as um, the workforce shortage or getting people to get in there, we're, we've, we've been examining this. And this is one of those stories that may be a little sad when you hear it, but we've been looking at a workforce shortage for 20 years now. And we have tried, we have met, we have discussed it, we have, uh, committed it, we have task forced it, and we, <laughs> we've been unable to solve it. Um, but it's not from lack of trying, and I think sometimes that gets confused. It gets confused that if the problem doesn't get fixed, then nobody's trying to fix it. So our society is taking on the approach of looking at um, a funnel leading into a bucket. And when you look at the funnel, the top of the funnel, if we could make it larger, can we take more students? Can we recruit more students? Can we get in the elementary schools? Can we get into the high schools? Can we be more visible? Can, will that help? Will we increase the number of students that are joining the, the educational programs? That's one thing. And then the funnel gets narrower as it heads toward the bucket. And that is the restrictions that the programs let us know about. Uh, it could be their clinical training limitations. Uh, so we see the constriction of the funnel, even though we may have enlarged the top, it's gotten where it stops the flow into the bucket because of constraints. So we're looking at definitely looking at admissions. We're looking at new admission standards. Could it be a, a nationwide pool where we look at a, a program share their applications that don't get accepted with other programs, looking at something that simple? Could we look at clinical shortening of clinical time. That way maybe two students could get trained at the clinical site at the same time as one used to. And then we look at the, we take that workforce, take the students and the graduates into the workforce, and then we have issues in the bucket. The bucket has holes. So it may be salary. 
it may be um, advancement into another field. Maybe another field's more attractive to our graduates once they get in. A lot of our feedback this past year was the workplace environment. The stress of COVID on the lab workplace with the shortage of staff and the amount of testing that was being done puts more undue stress on that employee. That employee decides, is there something better than what I'm in now? And we're losing, we're losing the graduates from the programs to the profession because they're leaving the profession through one of the holes in the bucket. So we've got our work cut out for us, uh, but we are looking at all those issues and all those different things that we can do. Um, but that leads me to one of the things that we were asking Congress to think about is looking at two things. One is establishing scholarships, loan payment, repayments for the students. Um, other professional, other healthcare professions have that where a student has forgiveness of some loans based on working in certain areas that they're medically deprived or down, you know, <laughs> medically underserved. Um, but we've asked Congress to kind of take a look at some of the funding um, for that. And could we write a bill, which would be something like a health service core, um, a creation for us, not an add on, but just creating it separately for our profession. That would be one of the asks we've had. And then the other one is asking for federal funding to expand programs. And that's where you ask, you know, growing new programs, creating new programs. Um, and that would be something we could do uh, from the government side, hoping that we could get um, more students if we had, you know, more programs or we had recruiting to those programs that we already have. Um, the other health care professions are doing that and they're getting, they're getting help from Congress for that. And uh, we would love to get involved and, and get, some, get some of that. So I don't know if, if, if the funnel idea is a great idea, but it is something that we can focus on certain spots. Some of us like to look at the top, some like to look at the bottom, some like to look in the middle. And I think we have enough in our leadership that we could address, you know, maybe two or three of those over the next year and maybe have an answer to the, the workforce shortage and see if we can, can increase the number of workers in the lab.